My name is Tobias. Before we begin, if we could have everybody in the audience please mute your microphone. We will be using the chat feature uh, this evening um, for any questions that you might have. And secondly, I would like to do a land acknowledgement, a brief land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Northern Colorado recognizes that UNC occupies the lands and the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. It's also very good to know how much our uh, uh, state uh, sits on land of 48 tribes that are historically tied to the state of Colorado. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to a very special evening via Zoom online and with various community members, faculty, and professional staff of UNC. I'm Tobias Guzman, AVP and Chief Diversity Officer here at UNC. Tonight, we have the uncomfortable task of confronting COVID-19, the threat to communities of color. The virus does not discriminate, but over the next hour and a half, you will see how this disease is reaching our most vulnerable communities and at significantly higher rates. On the screen, you will see who is joining us this evening and allow me to introduce you to them. Starting from left to right, Jessica Pimentel, UNC graduate student and soon to be graduate of UNC. Alfred Johnson Jr., UNC undergraduate student in nursing and soon to be graduate, graduate of UNC. Dr. Travis Boyce. Oh, the smallest one. Oh, are we sharing? No. You can mute your mic, please. Dr. Travis Boyce, Associate Professor of Africana Studies. Yvette Lucero Nguyen, Director of the Center for Women's and Gender Equity and the Stryker Institute for Leadership Development. Rudy Vargas, a candidate for the Masters of Public Health and the coordinator of Dreamer Engagement Program and Undocumented Student Services. Danya Carroll, a graduate of the Masters of Public Health and a member of the Navajo and Apache tribes and UNC alum. We also have interpreters, JC Branch, as well as Karen McCullough. And a couple more introductions briefly. Dr. Colleen Sonatag is the Assistant Dean of Students here at UNC. Renee Welch, the Director for the Center for Career Readiness. Araceli Calderon de Huiz, the Project Manager with Centennial BOCES and community member, and Colin Cannon, Director of the Advocacy with Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado and community member. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna begin with questions that are directed to our panelists. And our first question is Dr. Travis Boyce. Dr. Boyce, what are the historical aspects that are emblematic of what we are seeing today related to this pandemic? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Guzman, and thank you everyone for coming this evening. Um, I, at first, like I wish we were not meeting under these circumstances, but mm -hmm. I believe in a time of crisis, it's important for the university, for the community uh, to come together and tackle some of these issues. But as we think about, you know, some of these historical aspects that are emblematic of the COVID-15 crisis, uh, it's important for us to not dismiss the concept of institutional racism. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity because it's unmasking um, uh, so issues of social, economic, and racial equality in this country. Um, and just to give you an example in terms of this historical context of how racism works, and again, I tell this to my students oftentimes that we tend to want to box racism, the concept of racism, only in the framework of, of a bad word, of a racial epithet, or 
a, a, or someone that commits some type of offense against a minority group without ignoring the broader implications of what racism is. It's embedded into our social fabric of our country. It's embedded into our laws and policies. So we can look at, I'm just gonna share just two examples of how institutionalized racism works and how it's reflected in our current crisis today. Um, I encourage you all, you know, Google the Indian Removal Act of 1830 um, basically, it was a law that was passed by Congress and signed by then President Andrew Jackson, uh, who authorized that uh, Native people, particularly in the Southeast United States, to be resettled lands west of the Mississippi in exchange of existing lands in the state borders. So places like South Carolina, Georgia, um, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, where uh, many of these people were, well, ultimately forced out at gunpoint by um, U.S. soldiers and resettled in places like Oklahoma, among other places on reservations. Now you fast forward uh, 1830 to 1930 to 2020 and look at the state of these folks, these people um, on these lands. You know, there's high rates of diabetes. There's high rates of other issues because they are have been othered and underserved. Um, that has resulted ultimately um, in many of these th this particular group uh, to be disproportionately impacted by um, COVID nineteen, among other things, among their other problems that they're doing. But generally speaking, when we think about the spread of COVID nineteen and connecting that with the concept of institutionalized racism we also have to look at it's where you live you know this nation still remains relatively segregated based on neighborhoods and those who live in quote unquote racial ethnic minority communities likely live in places where there are environmental issues that impact their health there are uh food deserts um there's lack of access to medical care, among other things. And then you tackle that with other issues with regards to institutionalized racism, such as who is represented in the prison population? Who are the folks who have the privilege to stay home and work versus folks who have to go to work every day and constantly exposing themselves to COVID-19? So that plays a role into that. So, that's one issue to look at is the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Um, but also, most recently, I would encourage you all, again, just Google the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, in 1932 to 1972, this 40 year experiment was conducted by the federal government, a very unethical one. Um, and for those undergraduate students who are, who are on now, you know, this is the reason why we have IRB approval <laughs> um, with the Tuskegee experiment, among other unethical experiments. But basically, the U.S. government wanted to see how syphilis progressed, um, and they wanted to chart the progression of syphilis in the African-American population. So they identified this area in Alabama, the Tus Tuskegee area, and they identified over 300 sharecroppers um, who were infected with the disease. And uh, instead of treating them, uh, and by 1940, this was 1932 when the experiment started, by the mid 1940s, um, penicillin was now discovered and now approved and used uh, to treat syphilis. These men for over 40 years were uh, treated with placebos and with hot meals and uh, compensated with uh, burial insurance. And so these folks over these years, um, you know, went without their lives, not knowing that there was already this, uh, this already this, this um, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It's not going to be that penicillin was now founded, and that penicillin was now used to treat this. Now, again, if we think about this from a broader, again, from a broader historical perspective, uh, 
of, the, of our current day, if you look at the CDC statistics in terms of who is impacted uh, by uh, COVID-19, and if you look at what's happening in New York City as an example, um, African Americans make up 92.3% of the deaths per population, 100,000, uh, out of a population of 100,000 people. Um, Latinx make up 74.3, whites make up 45.2, and Asians make up 34.5. So these are things we have to think about from a historical context, that these things did not, you know, this data of understanding why Blacks Latinx folks are uh, disproportionately, Native American folks are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 is no accident. We have to look at various examples in history. So again, I provided just two examples, but there are many, many more that goes with that. Dr. Boyce, thank you very much. Um, we uh, appreciate the, the context of this and your, your made a very powerful statement uh, regarding this is by no accident. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's something that we probably need to um, uh, continue talking about and, and, and perhaps others will give some examples. Um, and what you're referring to is, is the systemic nature of, of um, what we're dealing with today. Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind uh, putting mute, everyone putting a mute um, on their, putting, uh, the, pushing the mute button, excuse me. All right. Thank you. Next, Yvette. After enduring eight weeks of a stay-at-home order within our state, from your perspective, is there any one reason or factor for the disparity we see that you hope people in our audience will take away with them? All right, thank you, Tobias. Um, and I did my best to narrow it to three. I hope that's okay. <laughs> ask um, my uh, professors in grad school. I didn't always follow all the rules to the instructions. <laughs> um, so I am gonna, I'll try to cover them uh, quickly so that way everyone else also has time. Um, so as uh, Dr. Guzman mentioned, I'm Yvette Lucetta Wynn um, and I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Um, and so in looking at what we know based on data provided by the Centers for Disease Control, um, it is apparent that among our racial and ethnic minority groups, the Black community has been greatly impacted with 33% of Black people making up those who have been hospitalized by COVID. In addition, death rates for cases in New York, just as Dr. Boyce mentioned, remain the highest at 92.3 deaths per 100,000 for persons identifying as Black or African American, and then 74.3 deaths per 100,000 for persons identifying as Hispanic or Latino. These data continue to support and validate our understanding that racial and ethnic minorities have been and continue to be those who experience disparities when it comes to health and access to resources, especially in the midst of emergencies like pandemics. In the context of this pandemic, a few reasons or factors that seem to be contributing to communities of color experiencing disparities include home and living environments, work, underlying health conditions, and healthcare access. Regarding living environments, a good example, um, just as Dr. Boyce also mentioned, are residential housing segregation, which is a result of institutional racism. And it continues to lead um, to people living in more densely populated areas, making it difficult to practice physical distancing or other prevention measures um, that are being recommended to us now. Regarding work, workers in essential industries who continue to work outside the home and those who simply have to keep working because of their economic circumstances are at greater risk for contracting COVID-19 because of their exposure. The CDC stated that nearly a quarter of employed Hispanic and Black or African-American workers are employed in service industry jobs. 
compared to 16% of non-Hispanic whites. Hispanic workers account for 17% of total employment, but make up 53% of agricultural workers. Black or African Americans make up 12% of all employed workers, but make up 30% of licensed practical and licensed vocational nurses. So once again, highlighting the um, exposure of these particular populations in the midst of COVID-19. With regard to underlying health conditions and less access to care, we know that the lack of health insurance um, also contributes to health disparities among our communities of color. The CDC has stated that compared to whites, Hispanics are almost three times likely to be uninsured and African Americans almost twice likely and will also um, be impacted through access of care and testing during COVID-19 without um, access to insurance. Another thing we know is that historical trauma, which Dr. Boyce um, gave us some examples of what that looks like, um, as well as experiences for communities of color, created um, a large distrust of the healthcare system. And that along with language barriers and financial implications associated with missing work also impact the ability for our communities to seek care during this time. Another thing we know is that communities of color have also shown to have serious underlying medical conditions. So when compared to whites, black Americans experiencing experience higher death rates and higher um, prevalence rates for chronic conditions. So underlying medical conditions like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, all of which are common conditions um, that we're seeing in hospitalized COVID-19 patients, um, as well as those who have died from COVID-19, um, continue to remain conditions that already impact our communities of color um, because of our historical um, references as well that we've noted. And lastly, um, the stigma and systemic inequities continue to undermine prevention efforts, increase chronic stress, and ultimately health and healthcare disparities. So in knowing the factors um, that influence um, health among racial and ethnic minority groups and data supporting that communities of color, particularly our Black and African American and Hispanic and Latino populations, we must begin to more directly identify these groups to be those we consider to be part of the most vulnerable populations in the midst of COVID-19 related prevention, safety efforts, policies, and practices. We must also continue to uncover and illuminate how groups like Native American and Indigenous populations living on reservations are experiencing COVID-19 as data is currently limited. With the awareness we now have with data supporting these facts, we really need to shift our efforts to also support including um, addressing systems that continue to maintain the destructive impact it's had on our communities of color. We need to allow this awareness to inform how we create policies, practices, both institutional as well as our own individual practices daily and form opinions around who are vulnerable to overall the overall impact of COVID-19. So to answer your question, Tobias, <laughs> one of the things um, that I do hope that we all walk away with tonight um, is the ability to start to critically examine through the, the lens of race, all the information and opinions that we're starting to hear that we have been hearing um, through the media, in our homes and in our communities, um, and to allow the information that we all hear tonight to inform how we even personally navigate daily um, and how we participate um, or perpetuate racism on a daily basis to really start to think um, about our own actions and our own, how we utilize our own voices to advocate for those um, who are impacted as far as our communities of color, as well as others too, um, during this time of pandemic. Very powerful information. And I think um, Yvette, uh, this, the use of data, um, you know, is, is something that I think, um, you know, we in, in higher education believe that uh, the use of data is important. And, and as you're 
building your case in terms of what you're saying and what your belief is, um, the data is very alarming. And I think this is why, you know, exactly, precisely why we're talking about this. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. Next, I'm going to turn to Rudy. Um, Rudy, could you talk a little bit about the pre-existing and current, current barriers specifically for our undocumented communi communities during this COVID-19 pandemic? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rudy Vargas, and I am the coordinator of Undocumented Student Services at UNC, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, before I continue, I'd like to point out that there are many barriers and many, many obstacles um, that the undocumented community has been facing for years, and um, it, is, it would be really hard for me to mention all of them. Uh, we do have a training at UNC available for students, and that training itself takes about two and a half hours, and we have already cut the time. So as you can see, there's a lot of information that I will not be able to cover today, but um, we've chosen some of the most pressing issues that, um, that most or a lot of colleges and universities are seeing uh, with uh, undocumented uh, students. Um, before uh, the pandemic, undocumented students were dealing with job insecurity. Um, so it was really hard for students to find a job without a social security number. Uh, jobs on campus or work study jobs are only available to those who have uh, a work permit. And unfortunately, since uh, a lot of the students who are undocumented are not able to qualify for these opportunities, they often have to go into the communities or, um, or find jobs that don't have, or to have uh, low pay um, and um, jobs that don't often have flexibility with their school schedules. So because of that, um, students were already, you know, uh, taking breaks in between semesters to be able to uh, save enough money to pay for future semesters. Um, so those, so, so the lack of, of, of a job and, and not having uh, an um, steady income, you know, was already, pre was already preventing students from obtaining a, a higher education. Um, the lack of financial resources has also been another obstacle that has prevented um, students from, from pursuing uh, higher education. Not all dreamers qualify for in-state tuition, and many come from working class or low-income communities, and they don't have the money to pay for school. And um, unfortunately, unfortunately, the limited options for scholarships uh, that do give students who don't have a social security number an opportunity to apply, uh, those scholarships are often only in places or in specific places such as California or uh, require that students have a specific major. So because of those reasons, students are not able to pursue um, those um, those specific scholarships. The third barrier is having limited access to healthcare, uh, and negative stigma associated with uh, with seeking uh, help for mental health. Mental health has prevented not only undocumented students but other people of color from obtaining the care that they need and the care that they deserve. So, if we talk about uh, how those obstacles have shifted or have changed since uh, the pandemic started. Uh, what we are seeing now are that these same barriers uh, are now being magnified by as, as, a, as a direct result of the COVID-19. The job insecurity uh, is still uh, is still in, in the mind of a lot of uh, people who are undocumented, people are losing jobs, so this affects the financial stability of the family. So now students are, are thinking about whether or not they're, they're going to have to, uh, you know, s step out of or stop out of school and, and get jobs so that they can support their families financially. Um, and those who, uh, with undocumented status may not be able to stay home to flatten the curve uh, because they need to go out there and look and look for the money, look for money, you know, look for uh, for income. And even those who have DACA are also facing a lot of challenges uh, as their, their work permits are expiring. And since uh, a lot of offices are closed now, a lot of the processes are being delayed and, and these people don't have, um, or their, their permits are expiring and um, they're not able to get uh, uh, unemployment benefits after, after their the DACA permit has, uh, has expired. So, so that has prevented a lot of, a lot of uh, people from this community from receiving the proper healthcare and also from receiving uh, the stimulus check that, um, that they need or unemployment benefits as well. Talking about finances, uh, we, we are still uh, looking at different factors and, see, and seeing how universities are going to be affected by, uh, by the outbreak. Uh, however, we do expect, uh, and when I say we, uh, I, I talk about higher um, education professionals. I have attended a few meetings in the last few weeks where uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of colleges and universities are talking about these issues. 
Um, so we, we are foreseeing uh, less scholarship opportunities for students and uh, there may be reduced, uh, um, um, reduced help from, or reduced institutional aid from, from universities and colleges around the nation. Um, and not to mention the CARES Act uh, that uh, was given to a lot of colleges and universities to, to help students uh, in this situation um, does not include dreamer students. So even institutions who, um, you know, institutions who are receiving this type of aid sometimes are not able to um, assist and document the students or students who don't have a social security number. Fortunately, there are some universities that are taking um, initiative and, and they are using uh, some institutional uh, money to be able to, to assist some documented students. However, um, those schools are, are very limited and they're only in specific locations in the US. And lastly, access to healthcare. Uh, there isn't enough representation of people of color uh, in clinical research. Um, and um, so this, is, this causes uh, people not getting the, the, the care that they need. You know, a lot of the times um, the service that they get is, is being generalized as, um, you know, a lot of people who are undocumented they come from the Latinx community and uh, Latinx, uh, Latinx community. They come from different places, different countries. They have, uh, you know, Different backgrounds, so they it, it's it's not um, it's not okay for uh, for you know for um, people to try to see the undocumented community as as one as just one group um, because it's it's composed by by people from you know from many different countries. So uh, so that uh, that causes um, access to proper healthcare. Um, additionally, being under uninsured has also been a major issue. Um, as people, again, don't get the proper care that they need. Mental health facilities are not taking new patients now. Um, I talked to uh, Dr. Gabriela Nagy, who is a professor at uh, Youth University, Duke University, um, and she, she mentioned how um, a lot of the times, um, or now, uh, a lot of these facilities are not taking new patients, so people who did not have uh, a doctor who they were seeing before are struggling to find someone um, you know, that they can go see and talk about um, their mental health or um, just the physical health in general. Um, additionally, there's intense fear for seeking health care in the community as people are fearing um, that they might get detained or that they might get, uh, that they might get deported uh, back to, the, to their country uh, just, for, just for trying to get the health care that they need. Um, and, and this is, it might seem like we are exaggerating, but um, in the past, uh, ICE has detained people at uh, DMVs, ICE has detained um, undocumented individuals at many places, and, and they break the rules. So um, often they don't, they don't um, follow the laws, and you know, we're seeing that they can, they've been taking people from even school. So, so yeah, uh, people who are undocumented, you know, they, they're afraid that, they, that, that they're gonna go to these places to get the help, uh, the help that they need, and that they're gonna get detained and deported. Uh, to the countries, so so yeah, all these all these um, barriers are preventing um, the undocumented community from getting the access the healthcare that they need. Um, also, attending a school, and I uh, one of the reasons why I keep mentioning um, you know one of the the reasons I mentioned um, going to university or having access to education is because most likely uh, in the future, if there is a, a Dream Act or if there is some sort of a pathway to citizenship most likely they're gonna require that people have some sort of education. So if at this moment people are having to step out or stop out of school, or if, they, if they're having to um, you know, take breaks, they won't be working in their education, which um, can potentially help them in the future to get a, a citizenship or some, some pathway to citizenship. Um, so it is important that, um, that we look into this. Um, it's important that people who, who uh, have DACA get, uh, get their permit, um, prolonged for, for at least two more years so that they're able to, you know, work through the pandemic, still get the benefits that they need. And then after, you know, after the, the, the pandemic, you know, maybe hopefully we'll get uh, a new administration or an administration that will have uh, more ideas for, for, um, for pathways for citizenship. Thank you, uh, Rudy. You've uh, illuminated um, uh, extensive um, information and what it tells me and probably others is that the fear is great. And um, fear being a barrier is not something that um, should be the case. Um, so we'll get more into that into round two of our questions. But before we do that, I want to remind everyone that the chat feature is available and Renee is um, taking copious notes. 
uh, so that we can um, address your questions. But before we get to that, we have um, Danya Carroll, who is our uh, other uh, panelist, and I have a question for you, Danya. What are the long-term consequences if we continue to ignore communities of color and the impact of this pandemic has had? Very specifically, can you address the communities in our, of our na Native nations? Good evening. I mean, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me on this um, in this discussion. Um, I am from the Navajo Nation and White Mountain Apache tribes and currently working with um, the White Mountain Apache tribe as a project manager in Arizona. And um, <clears throat> so the public health community has known for a while that communities of color face higher disproportionate rates of health disparities. Um, health outcomes that were already in inequitable for communities of color before the pandemic. So the pandemic has only deepened those health inequities for these communities. Uh, these inequities are due to many factors. Um, some of them have already been mentioned, such as historical trauma and racism. And uh, like Dr. Boyce mentioned before, um, within Native communities, we face elevated rates of underlying health conditions, such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And um, as a public health professional, working within my own tribal communities um, for several years, I have seen these inequities firsthand. And uh, many tribes have inad inadequate access to healthy foods, including fresh foods. Um, for example, the Navajo Nation only has 13 grocery stores that serve a, re a reservation the size of West Virginia. And so that's what we would call um, a food desert. And um, optimal nutrition and diet are key to preventing diseases later in life. So that's um, an area of concern. And um, in terms of healthcare, the Indian Health Services also continues to be underfunded. Um, very few hospitals and tribal communities have uh, in intensive care units, which makes it difficult to treat patients, especially at a time like this. And so many of the patients um, at, at this time have to be flown out to nearby cities. Um, I've had friends and relatives that have already went through that experience and um, they've had to be, be flown to other cities away from um, family and their homes. And um, the, the pandemic, it really has magnified all the health disparities and inequities that um, are current, that occur in Indian country. So it, it really has taken a toll on our food supply, uh, medical care resources and economy. Um, it, it's concerning because some tribal communities have not yet hit um, their COVID-19 peak. And they are also in states that are actually reopening. Um, so both my tribes, they have not yet hit their peak. We, we are still seeing the uprise in cases at this time. And it, it is very um, concerning, especially for our elders and those that are most vulnerable in our communities. Um, so we cannot ignore communities of color because we've seen an enormous burden and threat um, a major public health emergency such as the current pandemic can have. Um, the system is lacking a vital infrastructure and emergency response resources. Um, we have seen significant mortality in our communities. And um, I don't know if many have seen the news lately, but um, I think it's been getting a lot of attention that the Navajo Nation um, has, it's a hot spot right now, and it, it, it does have um, some of the highest cases per capita. And right now it's behind, I believe, um, New York and New Jersey. So that just gives you an idea of how, how hard um, COVID-19 is hitting 
hitting our tribes and our people. So. Um, in, in, incredible um, visual that you uh, mentioned, Danya, in terms of that comparison to uh, New York and the other state was what? Um, New Jersey. New Jersey. Um, yeah, absolutely uh, incredible. Um, <clears throat> now I um, will turn this over to Renee, uh, who has uh, questions that uh, folks have been asking. Um, and so I'm going to uh, ask Renee to uh, provide us with some of the questions that people might have. At this point in time, we folks have not asked questions. So if you have questions, please add them to the chat. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of one specifically. Is that okay, Tobias? Please, please. Um, Yvette and Rudy, um, I believe you both shared quite a bit of data about how COVID-19 is impacting specific populations. And I'm also thinking about both of your backgrounds in public health. How do you think um, individuals, folks that fear accessing healthcare, um, are impacting the data? So the data that you shared, um, do you think it is actual? Is that illustrating the actual impact the virus is having on different communities? No, if we, um, I, I believe that if, if we talk about undocumented or just, you know, immigrants in general, um, a lot of the times so going back to, to uh, the stigma of not wanting to get the healthcare uh, because of many different reasons, um, I, I feel like a lot of people aren't going to see the doctor because one, because of that, the stigma or because of the lack of resources that they need. So um, a lot of the times, you know, they're not even, they're, they're not getting checked to see if, um, if they have COVID. Um, some other times they rely on information that they hear from other family members, you know, so, um, for example, I've, I've, you know, I've heard so many people say, you know, I, I have the symptoms, so I think I have the COVID because another person told me that. Um, so it's things that, it's those things that prevent um, immigrants from, from one, being, uh, being represented uh, in a, a pro appropriately represented um, in, in, um, in like research, um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I, I just I just think it would it's it's it would be really hard to to get a, a, a an exact number of how many people are being infected specifically from this specific communities. Renee, I would agree with um, Rudy a hundred percent. I think it's the fear, and I think it's also right all the things that have been highlighted so far um, in regards to just um, how communities of color have been treated always and um, the that being reflected also in the conditions that they continue to have that have been named around obesity diabetes hypertension um, because there's a because of that lack of trust it's led to um, a lot of fear but also a lot of um, things that prevent them from seeking any type of preventative care so when they have the first signs we're not going in to see the doctor right away um, because of the way that um, people of color have been treated when they enter the healthcare system. And so I don't believe that um, the data that we're currently seeing, even though we see that communities of color being highly impacted, still not capturing um, everyone and likely those who are more so, you know, getting to the point of when they're being hospitalized, um, that they're really getting captured in the numbers as far as um, patients who have COVID. Thank so you. Rudy. Go ahead, Rudy. That I wanted to add, um, uh, with a recent conversation that I had with Dr. Uh, Nagy, uh, so a lot of times when people go, when people go and seek out healthcare, they only go to specific clinics that have, you know, people who are bilingual or that have people who look like them, and those are very limited. So when they go to those places, they already have uh, a lot of patients that they're seeing. So the the time that the doctors spend with the patients is very limited. Um, and so people are not getting referred to to the, the right providers. So that's that's another issue. Um, and, and also, you know, the, the lack of uh, bilingual professionals in, in this 
in this field, I, I feel like it's also preventing people from, from getting the help that they need and also uh, from us getting a better understanding of, of how COVID is affecting uh, communities of color. We have a few more questions here. Is that okay, Tobias? Keep going. Yes. Um, Dr. Boyce, we have a question from Gabriella. What are the barriers for communities of color following guidelines for maintaining safety? For example, social distancing, using personal protective equipment. And um, what are any structural, like um, the structural oppression that prevents individuals from being able to apply these recommendations? Can you address some of those? Um, can you repeat the first question again? I'm sorry, I didn't. Of course. What are the barriers for communities of color following guidelines for maintaining safety? For example, social distancing, using personal protective equipment. And what are the uh, structural op oppression related topics that prevent individuals from being able to apply these recommendations? Okay, um, let's start with the first question in terms of just the barriers. Um, again, I go back to um, the concept of racial segregation. Um, and we can look at the city of New York or the greater New York area as a good example of why COVID-19 uh, is spreading fast and also disproportionately hitting um, black and brown communities much, much harder than their white counterparts. Um, and it's a simple fact because it's a dense population. And so obviously that is a huge barrier. I mean, if you're living in a in a city <laughs> the size of the total population of some, some of these small states in our country. Um, but at the same time, um, we also have to think about in terms of other structural, I'm sorry, so, other barriers um, such as uh, who has to work in certain industries, who has the privilege of working uh, from home as a university professor or uh, in a white collar job versus um, folks who are working um, in essential jobs that require one to go out into the public, such as a sanitation worker, such as a bus driver or, you know, subway worker uh, in hospitals or in uh, food industries that require people to be face to face. So. Um, in terms of just those barriers, I mean, to be quite honest, I am not sure how this community of color can avoid these barriers, this social distancing, as examples, because they're often packed into certain places. That goes the same for the city of Detroit. That goes the same for the city of New Orleans. Um, my fear is, like, look at the city of Atlanta, uh, which has a large black population. So I hope I'm answering that question correctly because I'm just hearing it quickly and trying to jot down notes. Uh, but it seems to me I'm a bit pessimistic that you know people can avoid those barriers without further guidance as well as resources from the federal, state, and local governments that can make their lives easier. So that's the first question. And Renee, can you repeat that second question one more time? <laughs> of course. Okay. Is there any structural oppression that prevents individuals from being able to apply these recommendations? So, of social distancing. So are there structural oppression to prevent people from following these guidelines? Yes, Correct. I can see. Sorry, I had to think about this. I guess it was the way it was framed. It just seemed a little bit wordy. Um, but I, I think if you look at, um, let's just go back to institutionalized racism and the double standards that come with it. And if you follow social media or if you follow regular mainstream media, you know, you see a tale of two countries. And again, I go back to New York City where uh, members of NYPD were handing out masks to white sunbathers. But in another part of New York City, 
they were pushing um, and pushing black people back um, using excessive force to uh, comply with social distancing and not applying that to, uh, to whites in that regard. So there is that, and I think, I hope I'm answering that question correctly, but I mean, you can see that structural oppression right in front of your face in terms of just the double standards of who gets uh, access, who can uh, defy the law. We can think about that again for the protesters, the right-wing protesters who were uh, invading state capitals um, with, with guns and how the media portrays that versus a group of black students who are having a house party. They're, they were totally wrong, but the way it's framed is often on the side of the benefit of whites. If I could jump Dr. in, um, I, if I could jump in, uh, you know, one of the thing in, uh, things that I think about in terms of communities of color and some of this, these restrictions, um, which again are, are appropriate of social distancing um, and the use of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, again, we have to think about the privilege of using personal protective equipment and ultimately the reason why maybe some of our people of color, communities of color, students of color may not um, always be interested in doing that is because the, the consequences have been very different for them. Um, it is very similar to having someone wearing a hoodie, and a hoodie is something that represents something very different for um, a, um, a black male versus um, their white counterpart um, who is also wearing a hoodie. So there's, there's different things that happen to to communities of color that, um, frankly, um, you know, is, is what it is. And, and it's not uh, an acceptable, um, uh, it's why there is pushback. There's why, that's why there is a, a continued problems with that. Any so, emotional problem. And the reason for that, why after you've been to the moon, now where do you go? That seemed to be the end. Oh, the or later after the was to make sure okay. that they had a major project lined up. Can we just check uh, the mute button, please, everyone? So, like, wrap up one goal. so I have um, Tobias another question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Danya, if you could start us off and then um, other folks chime in. There are a couple questions here around the idea of the question, there's a similar concept around how do we, while um, working and um, being socially distanced from one another with the inability um, to gather or protest, start to combat, combat um, inequities, racism, um, as a way to uh, make change related to these topics? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think uh, that right now what I've seen a lot online and like social media is um, there's been a lot of, I guess, raised awareness about um, the environments and the problems and again, the injustices that um, I guess, native, especially with Native communities, what we face and um, yeah, I think that the raised awareness and um, partnering and working with other people, non-Native people, other communities of color, um, those, those partnerships are just as important to combat the racism and raise the awareness and try to figure out solutions that um, can address all these problems that we've been talking about. And, um, and I think, I mean, I mean, it's, all of this is terrible, everything that's happening, but I do see that um, there's also been a lot of 
great things that have come out of um, what's been happening. Um, I think, I think I've seen a lot more of it happening with um, the Navajo Nation and a lot of grassroots efforts. Um, it's amazing what's happening out there with um, within the community itself and um, working together and getting food to people who need it the most, um, especially people living in the, the more remote areas. And, um, and then I think there's also been help from outside too, which is just as important. Um, I think even, there's even been um, celebrities that have kind of stepped up and um, brought awareness to the problems happening within Indian country. And, um, uh, and again, I think a lot of it is just education. Um, I know there's a lot of ignorance out there. A lot of people don't know what happens in these settings and why it happens. Um, so I think education is um, really important, especially in a time like this. Um, education about our history, native history. I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, all the things that happen to um, different tribes, the relocation policies, assimilation policies, boarding schools, um, and yeah, all of that has accumulated and that's why um, t tribes are where they are at today. And it, it, those things happened over many generations and it is gonna take probably many, many generations to correct it and um, address it. But yeah, so I think um, those are what, the things that I've observed um, with people in terms of racism um, and, and just correcting people if they're inaccurate, especially if they're um, taking these, taking information from um, sources that are not credible. Thank you. Very good. We're going to switch now to uh, round two of our questions, and we're going to start off with uh, two of our UNC students. Um, in addition, I would like to make sure that Araceli and Colin uh, from the community um, also have an opportunity to chime in on answering some of these questions, especially from the lens in which you work uh, on a daily basis. Um, but first, I'm going to direct our attention to Jessica. Congratulations on being a new uh, master's graduate um, at UNC. Um, in addition, um, I have a question for you. For so long, we have been pushing for students to go to college and get a degree. What has this pandemic done to that constant refrain? And as soon and as a soon-to-be graduate with a master's degree, what advice, perspective do you have for students and specifically for our students, our communities of color? Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Jessica Pimentel, pronouns she, her, hers. And thank you all for having me here. Um, and well, to start off, I want to say that we have to also look at this through their intersecting identities that many students have, such as class, nationality, gender, or sexuality, having a disability and or being first generation on top of being a person of color. Just to give you all a little context, I want to acknowledge um, that I had privilege of being able to work remotely and in my graduate assistantship and my master's degree from home. But personally, I've even struggled with being, us, being home as I came to like home for like a million responsibilities. I had to learn how to balance all of these things with my classes and work especially having time to be on meetings via Zoom or Teams. As others living with me, that is hard to have like a quiet space. And furthermore, many other students shared with me having similar situations as mine, as they mentioned how they have had new responsibilities, such as becoming the only person bringing income to the household and how that has been their priority since their parents are not essential workers. So they work all day and have minimal time for school. Then on top of that, being first generation, um, 
their parents do not know how to support their younger siblings in their coursework and now even became their siblings teachers. Um, then on the other hand, we have students that have their parents out working every day because they are essential workers and they fear the safety of their parents and themselves as they do not have health insurance or means to pay out of pocket for health care costs. There has been many resources for some folks and many people of color do not benefit from resources even with um, even with then like there's this thing called public charge um, policy. Many do not have guidance to know like what COVID-19 resources out there um, that do not fall under the public charge. And even like Rudy mentioned with the undocumented community, there's many that don't want to risk having that path, lose their pathway of citizenship if they um, reach one of these resources and it's considered a public charge. Um, then some students that are struggling with like the whole online transition with their disabilities, they're not able to receive the right accommodations. So with all this being said, it's difficult to stay motivated during this pandemic to get a college degree. Many students have reached out to their professors for support as navigating this pandemic since it has not been easy. Uh, many professors have been supportive, um, including mine, really appreciate them. Um, they, by being equitable and providing syn synchronized and asynchronized learning. Although many have done tremendous efforts in aiding their students, many have not. Some students that I connected with have been struggling reaching professors as, as it is taking them four to five days to respond, um, while others have been assuming everyone can get access to internet or a computer and some even added more assignments when their students already had difficulty transitioning online. Um, I personally found that to be very inconsiderate from professors, especially in the situations that we're in. And this just reinforces the importance of professors being inclusive, equitable, and culturally responsive. Moreover, I brought up these examples to reflect on how we can better understand the students, because how can we expect our students we serve to continue their education when they have all this they have to deal with. Um, then I also think of the culture aspect for incoming students or continuing students, how many parents are afraid to let their students go to college during this pandemic and worry about their safety and letting them be on their own. Also the financial piece, as many are already struggling as it is now, college can be another financial burden. So with all of this, I know it was a lot, um, I have mentioned to take into consideration, I would advise students to explore their options, especially incoming students. I think find out what will work for your circumstances and reach out to others to find out what resources are available. I know many institutions are planning to um, operate in the fall by in-person, while some do not and plan to still have remote learning. Um, I think to do your research and again look at your options i for example i think um plan to have you can plan to have L, take lacs instead of doing the core classes this upcoming fall semester and maybe leave the classes that require labs for the spring um and i know it's easier said than done but i would also say to the students that they have worked so hard Perhaps their families along with them have made many sacrifices to achieve your educational goals. So don't let this pandemic keep you from moving forward. Um, and as far as the continuing students, I would say reach out to your resources. I know um, the cultural and resource centers are still operating virtually. Um, reach out to um, SOS, Student Outreach and Support. And I know there's like many, many departments that are still um, available virtually. And lastly, my last piece of advice would be to do some self-care and take care of your mental health. We may be social distancing, but they don't have to feel as though they are going through this alone. Now more than ever, it is important to take some time for themselves and their mental health as well. There we go. Excellent, Jessica. That was very helpful. Um, and it, uh, it, it shows that you are getting a, a, a master's degree and uh, you've done your research. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next I'm going to turn it over to AJ. And uh, AJ uh, is a, uh, gra going to graduate uh, with his nursing degree. 
Um, and this question is, is something that I think uh, gets into, uh, dives in a little bit more in, in terms of what is a, a considered a little bit more controversial. Um, and I think it all depends on who you, you talk to. Um, so uh, AJ, we often talk about <clears throat> a person's zip code is a better predictor of health outcomes than a person's genetic code. Can you share with us the social determinants of health and the intersection they have with this particular pandemic? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Guzman. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining this call. My name is Alfred Johnson, Jr. I will be a graduate from the University of Northern Colorado School of Nursing uh, in about 12 hours or a day and a half when I get my <laughs> last assignment submitted. Um, the perspective I offer is straight like that from the perspective of a nursing student. Uh, the five semesters that I have been working in this program, I've been fortunate to serve in the Denver metro area and also the northern Colorado area, including Longmont, Greeley, Fort Collins, all that good stuff. Um, and the beauty of it is that I've been able to gain different perspectives and understand that when it comes to disease and comorbidities and complications and detriments of health, uh, it affects everyone of all aspects of race and color. Um, and is also something that requires the attention of everyone to help combat that. So just to begin our discussion, I'd like to discuss the five uh, social detriments of health and what they are. There's economic stability, social and community context, neighborhood and environment, healthcare, and education. For the sake of time, I would like to just focus on two of those, uh, primarily being healthcare and education. Um, through the discussion with our panelists, we have talked about many um, very significant statistics that pertain to people of color and how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting them. Some that we talked about as chronic conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and also the likelihood of stroke has increased for uh, people of color compared to those who are white. And also mentioned um, from one of our panelists that African-Americans are two times likely to be uninsured and Hispanics to be three times likely to be uninsured. So when you think of that, you have to understand the kind of population you are dealing with and also how to adequately assess that in a community standpoint. So regarding healthcare, some of the uh, primary things that we notice with COVID-19 are the symptoms that we understand are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Great, that is, <laughs> it can be said for a lot of things um, and conditions that can precipitate those kind of factors. So making sure that we are understanding what exactly we are trying to tackle is what is, is what the steps that are need to be done to adequately assess patients when they're in the healthcare environment. So um, understanding that, you know, um, just because there is a lobby who is here, um, you know, you have a lobby of patients that are primarily African-American or Hispanic, you may have a nurse who may have a predisposing bias of, oh, they're not really feeling that way, they're not actually sick, or oh my gosh, why are they here? Why didn't they come here two weeks ago? Little things like that, um, really are the reason why that we continue to have this conflict of how people of color are affected by uh, affected directly by the healthcare system and also some of the prejudices that Dr. Boyce had spoke about uh, to why there is a certain extent of mistrust in today's society. So we definitely need to work on uh, needing for the understanding of how these chronic conditions and comorbidities can affect clients and also how that will direct their impact of being accepted into the healthcare facility. So understanding that not um, a large portion of these communities of, of color are insured, meaning they are not going to be directly admitted to a hospital because they are worried about the economic costs and what that means about going about receiving treatment. So doing so, it's important that healthcare providers are mindful of the um, empathy and the projection on how they attend to these clients because ultimately this is not just a black and white problem as we've seen. Um, it affects people of all ages. It affects people of all races as well. Um, and something that can go with that um, is also how not being uninsured, you could also run into the instance of not wanting to be seen by a doctor because you are under the impression that the doctor will actually undermine you prior to even walking into the door. So if I come in and saying, hey, I've had shortness of breath, a little bit of fever, and I explain to them my extensive health history, they'll say, oh, it's just your high blood pressure acting up. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, well, hey, doc, I'm actually a little bit more concerned because this has, you know, 
been agitated by, you know, me working out and things of that nature. And I'm worried that I can potentially put my family to harm. Oh, don't worry about it. You're fine. Just uh, continue taking your high blood pressure medication and this will handle itself. Little things like that um, definitely work to affect the, the statistics that we talked about and how these um, affect communities of color directly. And the other aspect of the social detriment of health I would like to talk about is education. Um, we also talked about how social distancing is not always enforced, especially with the uh, recent protests and folks speaking out about how this virus is a hoax and how people are making it up and that they aren't likely to catch this condition because they're strong and their immune system has survived H1N1 and other severe uh, complications. But again, a virus doesn't care who you are. If you are prone to catching a virus, you will be likely to catch it. So um, we need to definitely focus on how we are projecting to our communities to adhere to some of these policies, such as social distancing, such as wearing a mask out in public, wearing an entire mask that is not just cut in the middle, but covering your entire mouth um, and keeping you protected in times like this. Um, in another instance for education, we need to understand the nurse bias and prejudice and how we can serve the community as necessary. So um, if you were to have a certain population who may be reluctant to receiving care from a male, um, the nurse and healthcare providers need to be mindful of that and understand, okay, this family is here for this uh, condition and what they have going on, but they are not receptive to receiving assistance from a male. So what can we do to provide the utmost quality of care with them here in this facility so we don't send them back out into their communities when they you know, aren't ready for that because that is not going to help the problem. You're ultimately just letting, um, you know, a wound sit open and get more agitated because you're not actually handling the problem. Um, another instance I like to talk about with education is understanding cultural differences and how patients interact with providers and the healthcare system. Um, again, these um, preconceived notions that, oh, she's fine, she's not in any pain, um, she's just seeking medication, which can potentially be true but also requires further assessment because if you were to undermine every patient that says they need pain medication, you'll ultimately run into more problems than you would experience because you're not attending to their needs. Now, whether they need the morphine versus the ibuprofen, that can be discussed at a later time, but ultimately understanding that they are in pain, there are um, needs, that, ne needs that need to be tended to um, will really help further that relationship between healthcare providers and all of this goes into my last statement on education um, about understanding that conditions that may put a population at a higher risk than others. So we talked about many pre-existing conditions and comorbidities that can essentially uh, exacerbate some of these conditions for people of color. Um, that is on the healthcare providers and the hospitals to do their research and to stay up to date with the most evidence-based practice and understanding that, okay, we have a large uh, population of Somali residents. We have a large population of African-Americans, um, et cetera. How can we, as a community, whether it be Longmont, whether it be Greeley, how can we adequately prepare and make sure that our staff is trained and under the impression that the upgrade will be provided um, for these clients to help ensure that we don't encounter more disparities of COVID-19? That was a lot. So please let me know if you would like me to repeat anything. That, that was uh, beautiful. And uh, thank you so much for addressing patient concerns um, sometimes those are underestimated and um, uh, not always talked about, um, especially when we talk about uh, what's portrayed in the news. Um, so that's very, very helpful. I'm going to turn it over to Renee. There have uh, definitely been more uh, questions and we also have other resources um, within the audience um, that might be helpful in answering some questions. Araceli, I have a question specifically for you related to the systems, systems of education. And this question comes from the audience. What do you believe students of color have gained or lost by being educated remotely? And then there are additional questions from the audience about how do we advocate for students of color within our systems of education. And those questions can be for K-12 as well as higher education. So is that for me? Yeah, yes. Okay, 
Um, well, I'm gonna say something a little bit about the first question. How we're gonna get, what is, what is happening with the families and students being teached, being teaching, been, been learning from distance? Um, it is difficult. I'm gonna talk about more with the, about the families that I work with, which is migrant and refugees. So it is not easy for them. I totally understand it is an amazing effort that District 6 is doing. They are really doing an exceptional work in order to keep working on teaching kids. But the truth with our families, uh, migrant or refugees, is many of them, as many of the teachers know, they don't know how to use the computers. Many of them, they don't know, they don't have internet, internet access. And many of them are children from the essential workers, that means people who's working in dairies, agricultural business, or meat packing. So many of them, they have to be by themselves at home and they don't follow the instruction. They are required to attend classes, but truly if parents are not ar around, they're not gonna do it. They're not gonna do it. And we have an example of or a family who is working right now planting onions. So we have a family, group of families who they supposed to be at home teaching with their learning and teach with their kids at home trying to learn about the school. But no, the truth is they are working in agricultural business and because they, they have to work because they, if they don't go, they're not gonna have money to eat, or they they get the 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 message from the managers: if you don't show up today, you're not gonna get your job back. Because we have a lot of people who's looking for a job. So many of the families who are working right now in the onion fields, I hear from them. I. I hear that many of them, they are taking their children there. So I don't know, it is, and I hear great, great, uh, great, great sharings about what the people is doing to what I come, but not everybody is that lucky to be able to stay at home with their kids. And if they are allowed to be at home because they are not working, Many of them, they don't know how to use or implement uh, technology at home. And we get a lot of phone calls from families who say, hey, how do I put the letter G? Used to letter G and there is no point because they're not, uh, they're not gonna be able to be ready to help their children. We are talking families with preschool, no, no preschool, kinder, first grade, third grade, second grade, when the kids, they still don't know really well in the computer and parents want to help. So it is great. It is an amazing and the district is doing uh, the, as much as possible. However, we start. We still have families who are not being able to help. Once because they have to work and they have to bring their children. Once because they some they have to work and they left and attended their children because they have to work. And some others they stay home but they are not able to help. So I, I don't know. I just gonna. I'm just sharing. I don't know what is gonna be for these families. I think it's gonna be the same cycle. Children are gonna have children who did learn because they were they they got the opportunity to stay home and because the ones who had the opportunity to be in how and home we can check our children. But not everybody had the opportunity. So I would say when we are ready to come back in a regular basis at school, we're gonna be seeing again this different, this gap, because many of the kids, they wasn't ready to work 
in the way that we are expecting. And we have students, by the way, from high schoolers, they are, as soon as they get out from the school, they were released from the school, they didn't wait to, to take the classes. No, they are working. They are in Davis or they are in JBS. So what is gonna happen with these kids who are not able to take the classes because, or they are, do they take classes or do they support the family or the group with the people where, where they are living? So it is very difficult and we're gonna see the results very soon. I, I don't have it, but this is some of the things that are happening. Thank you, Araceli. Colin, can you share how the population of immigrants and, and of refugees that you work with have been impacted by the COVID-19 virus? And what are resources that you have available through the Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this conversation. My name is Colin Cannon. I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado. We're a community partner to the university and to Centennial Bosses as well. I use he, him, his. Um, so we've heard a lot from fantastic panelists so far that I'm, I'm only gonna be echoing so much of what they said. There's, I, I've created a little bit of a matrix here. I don't know if I can share my screen, so perhaps I'll just describe it. But in this matrix, I have four cells where each of these cells kind of combines and compounds to exaggerate issues faced by uh, varieties of clients that we have with varying immigration statuses from undocumented individuals to people with refugee status to people on various immigrant visa types. But in each of these cells, we could have economic barriers, housing barriers, linguistic barriers, and social barriers. And I'll say a few examples of each of these to describe the ways in which social fissures and ways in which immigrant communities were already facing barriers prior to COVID have been exaggerated, accelerated, compounded during COVID-19. So in the economic sector, we can look at the high density of immigrant workers here in Greeley who are working in industries such as meatpacking, agriculture, or construction. And the ways in which each of these industries keeps people, again, in high density or close proximity to one another with inadequate PPE, and also, because they have not been paid living wages or had access to living wages previously, they feel the need to continue working during this time of crisis because there is no other option. So too, many individuals are receiving insurance through their, uh, through their place of work. Now again, that insurance, if they've lost that job, they may now be without coverage, or it's the case that that insurance was never enough for them to begin with because they weren't receiving enough protections because there is not enough collective bargaining on behalf of laborers in those industries to receive the kind of benefits that they need given the dangers that they face on a regular basis. So that's, we can think about those examples for economic issues. For housing, as has been mentioned by Dr. Boyce, high density housing prevents people from having the ability to self-isolate. And so if you are living in high density conditions, and indeed Greeley is, in, is segregated as are many other cities to where you have families living eight people to a two-bedroom apartment well the ability to self-isolate if you have symptoms or in fact if you're asymptomatic but you've picked up the disease or the virus from someone else you then you then spread that to other people through no fault of your own but in fact because of the product of segregation which again is compounded from that economic access to work going from that you look at the environmental factors, environmental racism tied to segregation, whether that's the increased rate of comorbidities, perhaps you have asthma because you are in an area of town with poor air quality, or perhaps you are obese because you are living in a food desert and you don't have access to nutritious food. So too, it could be the case that you're high blood pressure and hypertension because of the stresses in your life that are compounded from those economic factors and the housing factors. You couple that with linguistic barriers, such as a language barrier, or not having access to current information or public health guidelines in a way that is meaningful to you, either because they have not been made in your language, or if they have been made in your language, they're on technology that you don't have access to. 
And so even if that information is present, you may not have internet connectivity, or you may not have the ability to listen to that information being presented because you may not be home language literate. All of this is, of course, exaggerated and made worse by social issues, increased stigma, increased xenophobia during a nativist um, period in our history, which again has been for a long time, but is especially amplified right now, blaming individuals who are foreign born or blaming communities of color for something which is of course not their own and the ways, in, including our own president who uses racist nativist language to further compound the issues being faced by communities of color. So each of these in these four cells, economic, housing, linguistic, and social, interact with each other. These are all intersectional. And so communities of color, particularly immigrant communities, um, are facing these barriers in an exaggerated sense during COVID-19. And this is why we're seeing increased rates. You could think about JBS, which we know has over 290 confirmed cases. And that number itself is quite conservative. This is because there is not adequate testing of people still arriving for work at JBS. When people arrive, they get um, a temperature check and they answer some questions. In effect, what they are answering is if they are symptomatic. Given how we know how high of a proportion of people in this virus are asymptomatic, they are being in close proximity to other people's and allowing that spread to continue. And so what this is creating is another high density hotspot. And if you're to look at the Weld County data, you see just astronomical numbers for our region. And again, it's all of those factors combining with companies such, such as JBS not adequately protecting their employees. Now, granted, they're doing a lot better after they were shut down and they've reopened, but there's this blithe, um, there's kind of a blithe posture toward, well, we got to keep up the supply chain. After all, we're essential. But look at the communities to whom that impacts the most. Sunrise Clinic is doing a fantastic job through telehealth and through making sure that people can access low cost care. But something that we are doing uniquely, and I'll end here at the Immigrant and uh, Refugee Center, is we are running what we're calling an immigrant relief fund. To date, we have dispersed over $46,000 to communities in need. This is, again, thanks to partners like Centennial Voces, who are helping us get in contact with communities we may not already be in contact with. And we're paying off people's rent and utilities. We are helping them with medical bills and internet access. Again, why we're focusing on these areas is because we want to allow people space to breathe so that they can take the steps needed to protect themselves, to make sure that they can plan for the future, and so that they're not avoiding medical care simply out of the fear that maybe I won't be able to afford it. And so this is why it's important to come together as a community and to look out for each other in these ways. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you for letting me join the discussion. Thank you, Colin. Yvette, it sounds like you have a, a comment. Uh, yes, Renee. I think that as I am um, kind of scanning through the chat, um, I feel like um, everyone on the panel has done an amazing job of really highlighting a lot of the issues and concerns that communities of color are facing currently, especially as it's been really illuminated through this pandemic um, and trying to instruct and I think folks are figure, trying to figure out like what can I do right I think we hear these things these injustices these things that um, we've been naming that have continued to be a part of our history and our present existence um, and so what can we do um, one of the things that I um, have started to try to do is to pay attention to um, the people that we're looking at when it comes to voting right i think that's one of the most powerful things that we have um, choice over is the individuals that we're putting in position um, that are creating these policies um, that are informing all of the um, practices that we're putting in place but really making all of those um, choices when it comes to um, how we engage with our system and so I would just encourage everyone to, to let these um, issues and concerns that you see and that you feel um, guide the way in which you will navigate um, our voting system when it's um, time to vote, because I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do to 
support our communities of color or our vulnerable populations that um, have, have simply been impacted by um, people who make those choices for us. And so I would encourage folks to use this information to really guide that because I think that that's a way that we can feel um, a part of making a difference as far as um, who we put in place of leadership. Because some of the things that we have been convinced of that can't happen have been made happen. When we talked about never being able to, um, that it would be impossible to give kids access to technology. A lot of areas, just like District 6, have found the way to be able to do that. We just need to be able to identify the individuals within leadership who are willing to make those things happen. Because we've seen a lot of things happen that um, otherwise have folks have told us would never be able to happen. Thank you, Eva. For folks still on the call, if you'll notice in the chat, I have added in a Word document that is uh, filled with resources. The resources include further reading, um, reading that just confirms um, how communities of color are impacted by the coronavirus. In addition to uh, resources, uh, some identity-based resources and some specific UNC resources. And if you are a member of the UNC community and um, are experiencing discrimination um, and need to report that concern, you can do so through the resources on this document through our Dean of Students Office and our Office of Institutional Equity and Compliance. So um, yeah, the, re the resources will also be made available on a UNC website. Thank you, Renee. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, we had incredible information and knowledge that was just shared with all of us. In addition, there are still um, questions that we have not answered uh, due to time, and we will provide answers for those in the resource document. Um, give us maybe a couple of days to get those in there. Um, but I'll close with a, a, a few things. Um, and I uh, recent, recently read an article that uh, illuminates uh, this particular statement. In the best of times, black, indigenous, and other people of color, those in the LGBT community, and children and families who are poor, low income, or subject to additional social and economic displacement are hit hardest by natural or human-made disasters and other societal ills. This is no less true and perhaps even, even magnified by the ravages of the novel COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.